Most people have some form of childhood troubles, which later result in poor decisions. Well, perhaps you find yourself in a similar situation and wonder where the spiral of bad decisions will end. Let's get into it. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ through the art form of audio drama. Yes, and that includes sound effects. I'm Timothy Gregory, letting you know that John, the man in our story, was off to a rough start at life. He never received affection from his father, got himself wine drunk at five years old, and had all sorts of bad influences around him. This is his testimony of going wrong before being made right on today's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. Many of John's experiences pushed him towards rebellion. However, every person is still held accountable for their own actions despite what they've experienced. And self-centeredness leads only to heartache with lasting consequences. Also, you want to stick around because later we're going to give the rest of you an opportunity to enter yet another sweepstakes drawing for a prize. No, it's not a cash prize, but it is a prize, and I think it's a prize you are really going to like if we draw your name. But first, let's get to it, folks. The classic true story of John Connolly. <laughs> John, what are you doing? Will you look at this? What? He's been sneaking drinks from this wine bottle. How much did he drink? The whole bottle. It was full, sitting right here in this clothes basket. Now it's empty. That little rascal. Look at him wobble. He's drunk. Oh, you're going to be sick tomorrow, little boy. Five years old. The first time he was drunk on wine, the man in our story was off to a rough start at life. He lived on a small farm in Indiana with his mother and stepfather and siblings. This is his testimony of going wrong before being made right. It's the classic true story of John Conley, right now on Unshackled. The eldest of three children whose father was in prison for robbery, I was three years old when he was locked up. I remember visiting him once in jail, but I, I don't remember him ever hugging me. Mom worked in the fields and often took me with her, but most of the time I spent with my grandmother who read the Bible to me, the Psalms. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Well, that's a sad commentary on people, ain't it, John? Now, let you and me go out and pick some blackberries for supper. Fresh fruit is a gift from God. We had a good stepfather that I always called Dad, but I still hungered for my real father's love. When I was 10, I saw him again in my grandmother's front yard. Surely that would be the day he'd say, I love you, John. But it didn't happen, and I was angry at him for years. Every time I got a spanking, I wished he would come and rescue me, but that didn't happen either. Death became all too real to me. First, my grandfather's died, then my friend Butch. Twelve years old is awful young to die like that, John. What happened to him, Grandma? He was driving the tractor when it turned over in a ditch and he was pinned underneath. Why didn't somebody help him? There's two feet of water in the ditch. He drowned before they got there. It ain't fair. Nobody ever said that life is fair, John. It's a struggle from start to finish, but God will help us to cope with life if we give our hearts to him. You never know when your time is up. 
I wish I could go to the funeral, but Mom and Dad won't let me. They think you're too young. I'm not too young. He was my friend. Rebellion festered in my heart. At 13, I was diagnosed with epilepsy, something I outgrew in later years. That's the same age I ran away from home. I came back long enough to finish two years of high school, long enough to play one game of football, and then quit. Totally out of control, I smoked and drank hard with older friends. One night, five of us boys were out riding around when the police began chasing us. When the driver didn't stop, the police got tired of chasing us and shot out the back tires. We spun clean around and nearly hit a building. I can't believe I had to bail you out of jail. I didn't do anything, Mom. I was just a passenger in the back seat. Underage drinking is not nothing. We were just driving around. The police said you were being a nuisance, going up and down the same streets. Yeah, well, the driver likes this girl who lives there. What was I supposed to do? Find some better friends, John. I don't want to see you end up like your father, going to prison. Or worse yet, killed in an accident. I was 15 then, and about 16, when I decided that life ended with death. My grandma's beliefs were wrong. I joined the Indiana National Guard, but my rebellious spirit couldn't adjust to military life, and they gave me an honorable discharge under general conditions. I began to live as if there were no tomorrow. I was 18 when I met Lila, and we went out binge drinking. You like to drink too, don't you, John? Ever since I was five years old and drank my first quart of wine. (laughs) Did you get sick? I didn't feel too good the next day, but that didn't slow me down. Oh, my kind of (laughs) guy. My stepfather made me smoke a cigar then, too. He thought it would cure me of smoking. Uh, It didn't work, I see. (sighs) Nah. (laughs) Hey, my folks own a tavern. Come on, let's go there and I'll introduce you. Lila was only 17, but she already had a baby daughter when we began dating. We spent the next eight months drinking together. My family was not thrilled with our courtship. You're not getting serious about her, are you? Why not, Dad? I know that girl. She's nothing but trouble. He's right, son. I don't care. I love her. I want to marry her. Think twice, John. You're only 19, and marriage is serious business. You're too young to take on a family, son. You were 18 when you married my father. Yeah, but look what happened. I was too young to know better. She already has a little girl, doesn't she? Yeah, so? Being a parent is the toughest job you'll ever have. I can handle it. I don't think she's marriage material, John. Nobody's going to tell me who I should marry. Don't say we didn't warn you, John. We married, and our life was all about drinking and parties every night. A few months later, we moved to Peoria, where her two sisters lived. The drunken parties grew worse. I became tired of the wildness, and we split up five times, always getting back together. One day at work, someone called and told me to pick up my wife at a party. When I arrived, my sister-in-law met me, waving a forty-five. <laughs> It's about time you got here, you louse. You should have been here an hour ago. Don't point that gun at me. I'm going to blow your head off, cheating on Lila. What what are you talking about? I know you've been going out with other women. You're drunk and out of your mind. I got a phone call. Saying you were out with another woman. I just stopped off at a bar to get a drink on my way here. Liar! Shut up, or I'll shoot you right now. Stop waving that gun, it might go off. Oh, sounds like somebody called the police. A family member came out and managed to get the gun away from her. When the police arrived, they broke up the party and took me to the station for questioning. They asked if I wanted to press charges, and I told them I just wanted to go back home to Indiana, which I did. But I returned a few days later, willing to give our marriage one more try. Lila and I were okay at first. How come you left anyway? I'm tired of all the drinking and parties. Oh, you sure liked to drink when we were dating. Yeah, but it's too much. 
Then your sister-in-law put a gun to my head. That was the last straw. Oh, come on. But she was drunk. That's what I mean. Your family and friends are always out of control. You should talk. Let's not start arguing again. Called up my old boyfriend after you left. I was only gone a few days. Well, how was I know you were coming back? I thought you were gone for good. Did you two get together? Yeah, but, but don't worry. It won't happen again. Marriage and our reckless lifestyle were too much. The next morning, I packed some clothes into a small duffel bag and left for California. I drove to the state line and stopped to call her. I figured you'd be up by now. Hey, where'd you go? We're finished, Lila. I won't stay with an unfaithful wife. I told you it won't happen again. It was nothing. It is to me. I'm going to California. Well, I need the car. I'll give you directions to where I'm going to leave it. Have your sister bring you over, and you can have it. I hitchhiked to California, but stayed only a few days before I returned to my parents' home. They were right. Our marriage had been a big mistake. We were both too young, and alcohol made our life an emotional roller coaster. I never saw Lila again, but I didn't realize that divorce would only lead to heartache down the road. Folks, we'll get back to John's story in just a moment. But first, I want to share a bit about how our ministry is able to bring hope to people all over the world. Unshackled is now in its 71st year of spreading the good news through powerful stories about real people. Our success is a result of God's blessing and the involvement of, well, supporters like you. When you contribute to Unshackled, it has a direct impact. Your support allows us to hire quality writers, talented actors, as you can hear, a skilled production team, and a devoted staff. Through your support, we're able to share Unshackled worldwide. So, in order to continue the work of spreading the gospel and allowing us to offer this program for free, won't you consider making a donation to Unshackled? It's really quite easy. All you need to do is click on the live link, if there's one where you're listening, or visit our podcast website at unshackledpodcast.org. That's unshackledpodcast.org. Dot org and then click the donate button. Or you can always write a check, unshackled. We take checks. You mail that check to 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607. We thank you for your partnership in our ministry. And now, back to the classic true story of John Conley. I had no idea that I would be so miserable after leaving my wife. Two years went by, two years of chasing girls and partying, trying to fill the emptiness that I felt. I tried working various jobs, but I couldn't seem to get my life under control. Finally, I got a lawyer and filed for divorce. When the divorce was final, Lila wrote, wished me the best, and that was the last time I heard from her. Shortly after that, I met a nice girl named Pat. I was married once before, too, John. You're divorced? Yeah. He left me and married another woman. The best thing about my marriage was the three beautiful children I have. Wow. My ex had a daughter, too. Seems like nobody talks about divorce, and yet it's all around you. Yeah. You start out with all these wonderful ideas, but they don't always work out. I was heartbroken when I had to get a divorce. Yeah, me too. But at least I have my parents to help me. They love the grandchildren and take them to church on Sunday. D do you go to church, John? Well, I went to Sunday school with my grandma when I was little. I haven't gone in a long time. Huh. Well, maybe you can go with us sometime. Sure, I'll, I'll do that. When I was little, my folks took me to visit Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago. Have you ever been there? No, I never heard of it. Well, they helped the down and out by sharing the gospel with them. And they demonstrate the love of Jesus by caring for their social needs. Hmm. My dad preached there a few times. Yeah, well, good for him. Oh, he loves the Lord. Pacific Garden Mission also has a radio program about lost people coming to Christ. It's called Unshackled. It's like they take your life story and turn it into a radio drama. Well, my life story isn't much so far. Mostly disappointment. Hmm. The Lord can change all that, John. 
I'm so glad I met you, Pat. Hmm, why? I like you. And I think you'll be a good influence on me. Pat and I dated for about a year before we married. By then, I was 23. When our son was born, we needed a bigger home, so we moved to a farmhouse in the country. At the time, I was working for the state highway department plowing snow. That's how I met Pug Logan. He was also an employee. Do you ever see your real father, John? Mm, not since I was about 10. That's too bad. You missed out on a lot over the years. Yeah, well, he missed out on a lot too. I see that, being a dad to four kids now. Kids are great, aren't they? Well, they can be a challenge, but a hug around the neck makes up for it all. My dad never hugged me, not one time. Well, the Lord can restore the years the locust has eaten. I have no interest in God. He brought me through some difficult times. When there's no one else who cares, God does. If you say so. Why don't you come to church with us sometime? No thanks. I'm good. Well, they're a nice couple. I'm glad they live right down the road. I like them. I like them too, but not their religion. John, what is it exactly about having faith in God that rubs you the wrong way? I don't want to jam down my throat. Oh, does he do that? No, but his wife does. She's a real Bible thumper. Well, I like them, both of them. Your dad did ask me if I would start taking the kids to church on Sunday. Oh, will you do it? I guess. It won't hurt me none. And maybe I'll even earn some brownie points with God. John! <laughs> it couldn't hurt. I could use some brownie points after blowing it last month when I had too much to drink at the company Christmas party. Almost took out the entrance gate. Oh, I remember. But God doesn't operate on brownie points, honey. Yeah, whatever. One day I was at home talking with my mother on the phone when I suddenly felt my chest tighten up so much I couldn't breathe. I collapsed off the kitchen stool onto the floor. John, what's wrong? John, can you hear me, honey? Hold on, I'm gonna call emergency. Hello, operator. I need an ambulance right away. My husband just fell over. He's... he's unconscious. The first person my wife called after calling the ambulance was our neighbor, Mrs. Logan. I woke up hearing her voice talking to me about my spiritual condition. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh... Thank God he's waking up. You need the Lord, John. You'd better repent of your sins and ask Jesus to save you right now. Go away. You don't know how much time God is giving you, but he's giving you another chance. Every breath comes from him, for in him we live and move and have our being. John, call out to Jesus. Ask him to forgive you and to come into your heart and life and be your Lord and Savior. You don't want to face eternity without him. I don't want to hear that religious stuff. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John, the ambulance is here. You're gonna be all right. I had a severe respiratory attack and stayed in the hospital for a few days. At the hospital, there was no TV, radio, or magazines. The next day, I asked the nurse for something to read, but she was too busy to help and told me there was a Bible in the bottom drawer. I was reluctant to read the Bible, but finally I opened it to Psalm 57, one my grandmother had read me, and I kept reading. Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee, yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Selah, God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. At first, I was embarrassed to be seen reading the Bible. Then, I didn't care, because God was speaking to my heart in a way that I had never experienced before. 
The words were convicting me. They pierced my very soul. I read for hours until two in the afternoon when visiting hours began. A young man that I had never met walked into my room. Hello, John. I'm the Logan's pastor, and they asked me to stop by. Oh, hey. I see you're reading the Bible. No, my grandmother used to read it to me. Do you know Jesus? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> I've been reading the Bible for hours, and I can say for sure that I don't know him. Could I show you how to know Jesus? How to receive him as your Lord and Savior? You can repent of your sins and ask him into your heart. Okay. I want to do that. First of all, do you believe you're a sinner? <laughs> Without a doubt. You agree with God, then, because he says we're all sinners. Well, I've been at it since I was a little boy. Everyone is born with the sin nature, separated from God. But Jesus died for us so that he could bridge the gap between God and man. He wants us to go to heaven when we die. What do I have to do? Jesus did it for you on the cross. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. P propitiation? Appeasement. Jesus satisfied the judgment of God that the penalty for sin is death. Wow. Do you understand repentance, John? Well, I've heard the word in church. It means to turn and go the other way. It's like... Going down the freeway the wrong way, you have to turn around and go back the other way. Life is like that. You have been going the wrong way, and it leads to hell. Yep, that's me. When you believe that Christ died for your sins and you repent and ask him to save you, God forgives everything you ever did. Boy, do I ever need that. Then pray with me. Tell God you repent of your sins and ask Jesus to save you. We prayed together that day, and I felt a burden lift from my heart, and I knew I was different. The pastor said I was saved. Hi, honey. Hey there. You doing okay? I'm doing great, Pat. Uh, the doctor thinks I have pleurisy. What's that? It's when the lining of the chest constricts. That's why I couldn't breathe, and I passed out. Oh, sure scared me. Me too. But the good news is... I got saved today. What? I'm a new man. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, John, tell me what happened. Well, the Logan's pastor came in and explained everything about salvation to me. He asked me to pray with him, and I did. Oh, wait till I tell my parents. And mine. Right away, I quit drinking. But, but I'd been smoking for 10 years, so it took three months to break that habit. No more stopping in taverns, no more using the Lord's name in vain. I had been taking the children to church for six months in my community when I was saved, so the pastor witnessed the change in me after salvation. I talked with him about something that was bothering me. I see a big change in you, John. Well, thanks, Pastor. But how can I serve the Lord better? Be obedient to God's word. Follow the Lord in baptism. It's a, a sign of cleansing your dead past and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, I want to do that. What else? Are you reading the Bible? I well, can't put it down sometimes. Good. Memorize Scripture, too. As King David said, Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. I'm working on that. Good. You'd be surprised how many times Scripture will come to you just when you need it. If... You've memorized it. Hmm. What else? Are you telling others about your salvation? Yep. Wild horses couldn't stop me. <laughs> <laughs> Invite them to church, too. Uh, not the wild horses, the people. <laughs> well, I am, Pastor. And don't be afraid to pray, even in public. It's a witness to others. As soon as I know enough, I'd like to help out in Sunday school. If you know that Jesus Christ died for your sins so you can go to heaven... You know enough to help teach the children. My pastor became my friend, my mentor, and spiritual father. I supported missions, drove a bus for Sunday school, started a puppet ministry, and even did janitorial work at church. I continued to grow in faith. But something else troubled me. 
so I spoke with him. What is it that concerns you, John? I feel called to the ministry, Pastor. But some things I read in the Bible tell me that maybe I can't. Because of your divorce? Yeah. I mean, the Bible seems to say that. Well, God does hate divorce because marriage is a symbol of our relationship with him. However, I wasn't saved when I was married or divorced, and nobody counseled me about those things. I understand. And the world doesn't care about the things of God. <laughs> you can say that again. Follow your convictions, John. Bottom line is the Lord can and will continue to use you in his kingdom, whether you're a pastor or not. Our sins cost more than we could ever imagine. But God is greater than all of our sins, and he has work for all of us to do. I just want to serve the Lord with all that I have until I die. That's great, John. The Lord will bless you for living by his word and telling others. I continued to serve our church four more years. I even helped to plant a new church in town before we moved to Arizona because of my lung condition. 20 years later, our youngest son got in trouble with the law in Indiana. So Pat and I took a vacation and went back to help. I sat in court with him. How did it go? Yeah, we got through it. But I hope I never have to go through that again. Oh, rough, huh? I've never been so scared for him in my whole life. Oh, I prayed for you. I prayed a lot, too. I don't know what I would have done without the Lord to strengthen me. You have to wonder how people cope who don't know Christ. Our boy will be okay, Pat. He had a good lawyer and an understanding judge. Oh, imagine what it must be like at the judgment of God without Christ. I'm glad we don't have to face that. No, thank you, Jesus. Amen. My parents both professed faith in Christ before they died. I have many special memories of my childhood and the historical events that occurred during those years. I've compiled them so that I can be reminded of those years and so that my children can pass them on to future generations. Life has been good, thanks to Jesus. My own father never said he loved me, but God sent his only son to die in my place so that I could have eternal life with him. Now that's love. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Listening friend, you can have God's gift of forgiveness and eternal life by asking Jesus to save you. Wherever you are, God looks on the heart and knows your sincerity and your need. So trust him. If you need help making this life-changing decision, get in touch with us at Pacific Garden Mission, 1458 South Canal Street, Chicago, Illinois, 60607, or call 1-888-NEED-HIM. Now, we love hearing from our listeners here on the Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast, so send us your questions and we'll answer them here. It can be something you're curious about or just something you want to share with us. All you have to do is write us at podcast at unshackled.org or call and leave us a message at 312-281-1264. We'd love to hear from you. Now, before we get to our sweepstakes drawing info, I just want to remind you to subscribe or like our Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. You can even share it or tell a friend. We'd also love for you to review or rate our podcast. And don't forget to check out our other podcasts on this same platform, Unshackled Daily Devotionals and Unshackled in Person. We appreciate your input and involvement in our ministry. And again, please consider supporting us so we can freely offer quality Christian programming to the world. All right, here's the prize for our new upcoming sweepstakes contest. It's another beautiful wooden scripture plaque of Psalm 5110 that says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Folks, this is gorgeous, especially if you're looking for well, daily inspiration from scripture. You will love this authentic and very unique wooden plaque. The plaque has been sawn from a tree branch or log and 
while cut in such a way to retain as much of the bark around the perimeter as possible. This one actually looks like it was cut from birch as it has that really unique bark exterior. Uh, this plaque has been handcrafted around the natural character and beauty of the wood that God created. If you'd like to peek at this scripture plaque, just visit our podcast website, unshackledpodcast.org, and stop by the audio drama page. Unfortunately, we are only able to mail this plaque to locations within the United States, so our drawing is limited to U.S. addresses. But if you reside in the U.S., all you have to do to enter our sweepstakes drawing is call 312-281-1264 or email podcast at unshackled.org and give us your name, phone number, and email. The winner of the sweepstakes for this beautiful scripture plaque will be announced March 21st. But the deadline, folks, the deadline for entry is March 5th. And we look forward to hearing from you. And next time... I don't get why we gotta do this. It's court-ordered, so there's likely a good reason. You know nothing! I want to know about you. Look, my dad walked out on us when I was 10 years old. I hated him, and I hated my mom for letting him do it. You wouldn't understand the half of it. Well, my dad did walk out on my family, just like you. I rebelled against him and my mom both. Someone once said, emotional pain cannot kill you, but running from it can. I didn't want to be pushed around anymore. I was determined to do something about my fate. Such was the case with Molly, who built a wall around herself in order to avoid heartache. You're not going to have many people left in your life if you keep pushing them out. You won't be in my life if you don't mind your own business. But she would eventually find a healing love that would never fail. The Lord doesn't want you stumbling around in the dark. He wants to light your path, Molly. So listen as we bring you the classic true story of a girl we're calling Molly on the next Unshackled. Heard in the classic true story of John Conley were Stephen Spencer, Tina Glushenko, Judith Easton, Connie Foster, Jim Craig, and Demetrius Troy. Original music, Caleb Tolleson. Sound effects, Demetrius Troy. Sound assistant, Martin Robinson. Recording engineer, David Pierczynski. Audio engineer, Michael Kahn. Script, Kenita Gabler. That's it for this week's Unshackled Audio Drama Podcast. So until next time, unless our Lord returns before then, I'm Timothy Gregory, your brother in Christ. <laughs>